All right, we are live and on the air. Uh, our topic for tonight is trust in the black community. I think it's a relevant topic given uh, what's happened, uh, particularly here in the U.S. over the last couple of weeks with the election and a lot of the um, underlying concerns that, uh, that that may raise. But before we delve into that topic, let's uh, do a round the table and uh, a bit of an introduction of everybody. So Bennett, let's start with you. Hey, what's up? My name is Bennett Kelly. I was raised in Montreal and still reside there. Uh, you want me to talk about what I do for a living? Yeah, you just yeah, just a brief introduction of yourself. I have a long history in healthcare, and I'm also um, an IT technician with my own company for the last 11 to 12 years, and uh, dabbled in a lot of other things. All right. Excellent. Nice to meet you, uh, Lawrence. Yes, sir. Okay, I was born in Trinidad, grew up in Montreal, moved to uh, Mississauga, Ontario, and now I'm here in Bakersfield, California. I worked for Lexus uh, in the business office at Accounts Payable. Excellent. Nice to meet you. Thanks nice for joining you us. Guys. You're welcome. All righty. Uh, Richard. Born and raised in uh, Montreal, parents from Barbados and Trinidad. Uh, chef and owner of Bistro Nola, located in the West Island. Nice. Over 20 years. And what kind of food does Bistro Nola make? Southern inspired bistro. Southern inspired bistro. I like it. Cool. Nice to meet you, man. Nice. Hey, Stanley. Hey, guys. Name is Stanley. Stanley Paul. Born in Trinidad. Grew up in Montreal. Presently in Ottawa, Ontario. Working in the high tech industry mainly, well, started off with aviation, now I'm into satellite communications, doing pro program management. Nice, nice, nice to meet you. And over to uh, the one man pretty much everybody knows, Mr. Wayne. The connector, the vector. <laughs> <laughs> Wayne Harris, born in Montreal, parents from Barbados, now living in Mississauga, cybersecurity consulting. 25 years in IT. Wow. Excellent. I think we have an over-representation of Bajans on this call because... Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's independence. My, it's independence, yes. My name is uh, Sean Best, also born and raised in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Uh, lived for 20 years in Mississauga, Ontario, Canada, and have been living now in Atlanta, Georgia for the last um, six and a half years. I've been in uh, the financial services industry, mostly in the IT side, as a program manager for the last 23 years. And uh, right now I work in um, supply chain management technology. All right, so. Okay, hold on, hold on one second. Yeah. Someone has a TV on if they can mute it. Oh, that's me, man. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right, so um, and again, right. guys, uh, just before we, uh, we we get going here, if you have any plugs that you'd like to make at the end, just make a mental note of that, and I'll go on the table. You can plug whatever you feel like plugging at the end, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, okay. so the topic, we, we bounced around on topics all week long. We came up with a whole myriad of different topics and landed on this one, uh, I think, either yesterday or early today. And I, um, my perspective on this topic, trust in the black community, really is that a lot of the other topics we're talking about really all led us back to this particular topic, which is a very sensitive topic, um, but also one I think that merits uh, conversation and uh, different points of view. I'll do my best to mediate this uh, topic. Um, it can get very uh, personal, I guess, for some people, so we'll, uh, we'll try to keep this as, uh, as interesting as professional as possible and respect each other's opinions, but uh, Please, you know, don't hold back. This is a very interesting topic to to, uh, to discuss, and uh, let's start it off. Who wants to sort of take a first uh, a first pass at what their their perspective of the issues or the challenges with trust in the black community happens to be? Can we first start off by first giving a definition of what we're talking about in regards to trust in the black community? Sure. So we were talking a lot about. Um, uh, knowing our history, we're talking about specifically from a business perspective. Um, we were talking about how there are communities that, uh, other than the black community, so for example, um, East Indians, uh, the Jewish community, where um, that those communities tend to support them, each other, they tend to hire each other, they tend to uh, do business with each other, and in doing so, 
that community helps to build itself up to a place where they are properly represented from a political standpoint and where they also have um, uh, some degree of influence um, uh, from a community standpoint. And uh, I think the topic that, the way we kind of got to the topic was, uh, we said, well, what is the challenge that the black community has? Why can't we get to that place? And we started talking about, well, you know, part of the issue is, um, although, you know, we want to excel as a community and help support each other, one of our biggest challenges is just an absence of trust. Um, and the reasons behind that, of course, are we're probably going to get into all that now, but that's kind of how I think we landed here. Anybody want to sort of add to that? Did I miss anything that you guys wanted to uh, broaden yes. the context with? Yes. Yeah, so let's, we have to take it back a few centuries and then come forward. I'm going to do it quickly. Okay. So if you think about the continent of Africa and the people who were there before the transcontinental slave trade, they were doing their things in their groups and you know many thousands of different languages thousands of cultures but the ones we speak about are the people the elders and the community and there was a unity of thought everybody knew what their role was you had to take care of business to support yourself and support your community and then the elders would be the tiebreaker if two people in the community couldn't figure things out they go to the elders the elders would make the call kind of like binding arbitration today and then they would move forward and no feelings were hurt and you would move forward. Enter the slave trade, sons, daughters, mothers, um, your fathers being broken up across multiple plantations, being sold into different plantations. It's, it, for us coming from the Caribbean, you know, your mother could go to Barbados, your father could go to Barbuda, your sister could go to Trinidad and your brother could go to Grenada. So you snap that apart for 400 years and then, you're, then, then you get the whole adage of white is right and then light versus dark, right, from the shadism perspective. And that comes through for a couple of hundred years. And then you're free. You're free. No money, no land, no house, no community, no support. And everyone's scrap, scrapping for, for the... For the for the, for the crumbs at, at the master's table or former master's table, the sharecropping comes into play. And you move that through the last 150 years and now here we are. So I'm 50 years old, slavery ended 100 years before I was born. No, the the post-traumatic stress disorder that came from slavery across the entire diaspora has never been resolved. Imagine everybody having a form of mental illness which means that you don't know who you are, so you don't know who you can trust. That, to me, is a foundation of where we are. Let me hear what you have to say. Well put. Well put. I like that. Well put. Well put. Yeah, I can not say, say it any better. <clears throat> so, uh, so just to maybe encapsulate that a little bit, uh, prior to um, the diaspora, we had societal roles clearly defined. Um, after the, the advent and the, during the course of slave trade, um, all those cultural norms were erased. And what you have now are a, a population of people who have, uh, are now free after generations of having our culture essentially erased and having um, uh, perhaps trained uh, fears and, um, uh, to your point, PTSD. Uh, are now trying to figure out how do we move forward from here with the absence of uh, some sort of societal structure, some sort of role. So are you suggesting perhaps that maybe what we need to do is to revisit uh, roles to a certain degree, maybe um, the role of an elder versus the role of children, men versus women? Um, what are your thoughts on that? I don't know so, so much to say about revisit as to re-educate or just to plan out, just learn. Because everything I find, everything has been skewed. I mean, the, 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 the role of the, the father, the role of the grandparents. I mean, today kids don't even stop to want to pick up the phone or the parents don't even encourage the kids in most cases mm -hmm. to pick up the phone and reach out to your grandmother, grandfather. I mean, this is where, this is, this is what would potentially tie our children to our history, our past. The limited view that we have or that our grandparents have. But it's still, I mean, I've, I've learned so much from my grandmother about her life, what she went through, what she grew up with in Grenada before she moved to Trinidad. Mm -hmm. I mean, but my kids, I've, you know, the kids today, I'm trying to get my kids behind 
um, behind behind the grandparents to call them, talk to them. But the kids are so interested in something else. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of deflecting a little bit off, but there has to be education, more or less. Yeah, and I mean, I, I think what it sounds like you're touching on here is also potentially part of um, African culture, and that is a lot of history was transmitted from generation to generation verbally. Um, mm -hmm. And so we learned from our elders. We learned the names of, you know, uh, previous, um, you know, village elders, we, you know, previous, um, uh, you know, village leaders and so on. And, I, I, and perhaps to a certain degree what you're referring to is there's a, a, a sliver of that still in our community, except for the fact that the generation that we're dealing with now, our children, because I, I turned 50 in January, um, are a very different generation. They've always had uh, cell phones. They've always had the internet. They've always had all this. Um, they've always been surrounded by stimulus. And being able to sit there and just have a single conversation, at least my perspective is, it's a challenge for them to even be able to focus long enough to have a single conversation without having music in the background and YouTube running on the iPad. I mean, is uh, do you guys find, um, do you guys have that experience as well with your kids? Oh, absolutely. My daughter is completely um, uh, computer savvy, phone savvy. She knows the technology. She's, since she was born, you know, had the internet, phone, tablet. So she gets very distracted by this. And uh, But one thing, though, I do have um, FaceTime with family back home and her grandmother. So that's a good thing. So. Mm -hmm. Technology yeah. can work for you or it can work against you, you know? It's working for us right now. We're all talking to each other. We're yeah. all over the map here, exactly, right? Exactly, yeah. All right, so I want to I give one point of information. Uh, there's a fallacy that, that the majority of the African diaspora was transmitting their history orally. You have to understand that one of the first universities on the planet is in Timbuktu. Timbuktu, yep. And what, what today is Mali. And those scrolls mm -hmm. that are there... That's where Socrates came, that's where Aristotle came, that's where they came to learn what they took back and claimed as their own. And Boko True. Haram today is um, threatening Timbuktu and those scrolls. And unfortunately, no one in the diaspora is helping, but there's, there's some, East, some Baltic European countries taking those scrolls and taking them and protecting them against Boko Haram, who just want to burn it down and it would be a travesty to do so. But don't be mistaken that it's only oral history. We have written history, we invented papyrus, and we have written history across all the countries and across the continent in Africa. Well, but thanks to for your point, to your point mm -hmm. when the grandfather goes to one plantation, the son goes to another, and you speak Hausa, and now you have to speak English, French, Portuguese, Spanish, German, Italian, or French, you're going to lose that, and it gets lost in translation over 400 years. True, true enough, true enough. Okay. Definitely, definitely. All right. <clears throat> Okay, yeah. but okay. So with 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 the foundation that we've just laid here in terms of a little bit of history, coming back to the trust in the black community, how does the foundation that has been laid out over the years, as Wayne so eloquently put, to the whole issue of trust within our community? How did it? So we we, we kind of had the foundation of how it led to it, right? Because the knowledge has been broken apart, the the edification of where we come from, who we are, has been lost. Now, we're looking at it today in our community in regards to business, communications, dealing with each other. Okay, so let me, let me frame the four types of trust that are there today, and you guys can tell me what you think. So there's four quadrants of trust. The first quadrant is no trust. I don't know you, I'm not gonna give you my ATM pin and say take out $20 for me and bring the receipt if I don't know you, even if you're black, okay? <laughs> Not gonna happen, no trust, right? The second quadrant is distrust. And this is what the slave trade did to us because white supremacy, white nationalism, the alt-right, whatever you wanna call it today, mm. said that they are closer to God because they're in the image of God. When you look at your church, you see an image of Jesus. He's blonde hair or brown hair, blue eyes, he looks like them. So by worshiping him, we're in subconsciously worshiping them as what is closer to God, meaning we're the furthest from God. So we create a level of distrust, okay? So when you go into a church that's predominantly black and you look up in, at the stained glass, you see a white person there, enough said as to what's going on in that church. Not much is going to happen. 
for the people. So we move from no trust to distrust. The third quadrant is blind trust. Because I'm black and everybody on this phone is black, doesn't mean I trust you. It just means you're black. Okay? So I don't have blind trust for my race. Okay? I've been burned in the past when I thought someone had the same values as I did. Listen, Sean's from Courtney Nash. Richard lived a block away from me in NDG. Larry lived 10 blocks away from me in NDG. Stanley lived in the South. And Bennett, where were you? You were in West Allen all this time? Back in no, the day? No, Lost. No. <laughs> Lost. <laughs> right? I, I, was, I was in Laval. Laval. So, so, yeah. so, we have, so even though we're all Montrealers, if you ask anybody who lived in their city, you knew that your West Indian store, that you bought your curry gourd or oxtail from, that was their <laughs> spot. And if we right. had a discussion about that, everyone would have their own opinion about what's best based on their perspective. So the last quadrant is smart trust. A smart trust means I trust you at the level you should be trusted based on your actions and your words and the gap in between the two, which is called hypocrisy. So here's your actions, here are your words, the bigger the gap, the bigger the hypocrisy. If your actions and your words line up, then I can trust you at a smart level. Does that make sense? It does. I like the yeah. way you put that. So yeah. no trust. Distrust, which basically is a result of self-devaluation, blind trust, which is self-evident, and of course, smart trust, which is earned trust. Right. So what we have here is we have family, people with the same last name as us, people who share DNA with us, and we threw them into the blind trust category. Mm -hmm. And guess what happened to every one of us who did that? We all we got, got burned. burned. Yes, right. Because we're supposed to get burned. Because we're not supposed to live in that quadrant. <laughs> you understand? No. Yes. So we move from blind trust <clears throat> put everybody into distrust mm -hmm. and that's where we are today okay wow anything well, that you guys want to add to that because that, that's i think that sets up a really uh that sets up a really uh, good foundation for this topic to take off so if we are we being generally speaking um uh, a black community in a either one of two categories either a distrust or a blind trust situation how do we what is the we that we need to do, or let, let's talk, let's not talk about solution quite yet. Let's talk about examples of blind trust that perhaps some of you guys have have run into, or distrust that you guys, some of you guys have run into. Just I think some s examples would help for people to really uh, understand this. So um, I'll, I'll open the table to anybody who wants to tell their uh, their their story. Go ahead, Stanley. <laughs> no, no, no. Stanley's no, I'm going to keep it. I'm going to keep it at a really high level and keep it on, let's say, a business on a business front. And when I'm saying blind, and I'm, okay, business front, I'm going to talk about walking into a restaurant. Okay, my blind trust is if, if I'm going to support people within my community, I'm trusting that I'm taking my hard-earned dollars to go get a service from them, such as some food. I trust that they will have the food that I want that's on their menu that's that's up on there on, up, up, up above me and I come and I walk in and when I walk in I trust they'll have my food for me to get my dollars over to and when they tell me this is done this is done in the middle of the day <laughs> yeah, I, I know I'm keeping it very flippant seriously but that is something that I'm saying from a business point of view and I walk in there and I have to change two, three times what I really want. Mm -hmm. And I'm trusting for me to walk in there, take my time to leave my gas and my hard earned my time to go get what I want. Mm -hmm. And from a, on, on a business environment and I don't get it. That wasn't that because Nola. they didn't plan properly. No, 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 not even close. No, no loss the bar. You know, I can, I can relate to that yeah, story. There was a, um, uh, a roti place in Mississauga. I think they closed down now. Um, I won't say the name of the, company, the place, but they made awesome, awesome roti. They had like six or seven different types of roti. Um, but the one I could never get, unless I went in really early, was goat, curry goat. It was always out. I was like, why would you even have it on the menu if it's always out? Yeah, It was frustrating. You see, this is what we call – Inventory management and the chef is online here. So chef you can talk to us <laughs> <laughs> About that because here, well, here's what I know. Well, let me well, let me break it down to you this way um, There's just a lack of professionalism when it comes to food within the community period um, They think it's like uh, having a backyard barbecue 
and you're inviting your friends and neighbors in and whenever you feed them you feed them this is the mentality they have within the food industry within the caribbean community we're all okay. buddies and friends but this is not how it works yeah. you're running a business you're advertising to the masses you should be um handling yourself in a professional manner and this is what's missing yeah you know if i can add something to that richard because this is part of a conversation we're having online and i think it's worth having that conversation here um and i know that um bennett and i had this conversation offline uh <clears throat> as well and let me get your perspectives on this so when you interact with somebody uh from a business perspective in your restaurant who is from a different background, they may be Lebanese or they may be uh, uh, Moroccan or, or whatever the case might be, but they're not from the black community. What is the difference in your experience between the interaction you have with that individual and somebody who is uh, from the black community? Or is there a difference? Okay, wow. so I can't, how, how, do I, how do I say this? <laughs> Gotta say this. Just say it, man. Just say it. You're, you're live. It's, it's, I know I'm live, wait, thank you. <laughs> um, so, so okay, let me, let, me put it, let, me put it to, let me put it to you this way. It's a numbers game. We are, an, we are a minority. Um, I have other nationalities coming in, and yes, I will have issues with those nationalities. But like I said, if I'm serving 200 of them, and I have issues with two or three of them versus 20 people from my community and having issues with five, six, or seven of them, you understand what I'm, where, where I'm coming from with this, with this point? The percentage points are higher when you're dealing with our community than when you deal with other communities. Okay, so let's stop right there and ask the question, yeah. why? Yes. 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 Well, can I, can I put some two cents in there? Yes. Please do it. <laughs> Well, my experience has been I'm, I, I have a lot of clients and the kind of trust or destruction of trust that I see most often is I have a client, the first time they're good, the second time everything's good, it goes smoothly, the third time and the fourth time they want to offer me rights and peace for supper for my payment. Oh, that's so, terrible. This, oh, this, this, it sounds funny. <laughs> but it's happened to me on a number. Of, it's happened to me on a number of occasions, and um, it's that, hey, that not, you built up. Not to cut you off, this, <laughs> back, in, back in the day, that was huge. Someone offered you food for service. <laughs> know, well, I, even better if they really like me a lot. They give me some mopping with it. But I mean, <laughs> right. but um, the issue I have is, is you built up this expectation and trust primarily is based on past experiences and expectations. So um, you, you build this up and then it's just thrown against the rocks. And that, that makes it very difficult the next time you approach somebody. I know we're not supposed to prejudge. Like, prejudge, exactly, based on a different individual. But we're human beings and that's going to happen. Yeah. That's the, yeah. That's the problem I have. I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example. Three weeks ago, um, a friend of a friend calls me to, 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 to say to me, I heard you have a restaurant. And I said, yes, I have a restaurant. She goes, um, I want to support you. I said, that's fantastic. Support is, is always welcome. She says, well, I have a group that I would like to bring to your establishment on a specific day. I said, fantastic. I said, uh, you, you won't be, I won't be taking the reservation, but call the restaurant, speak to one of my, my waiters and, uh, They'll take your, they'll handle the arrangements. Before I could hang up the phone, she wanted to know what deal she was going to get. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I, bas I basically have to tell her there is no deal. Mm -hmm. We have a variety of menus for groups. You pick the one that fits your budget. Right. And we left the conversation at that. Right. Can I take, can I, can I build off of that Richard? Because I was, that was my next, uh, pl the next place I wanted to go with this. And that is <clears throat> when we talked, uh, when I mentioned earlier about, you know, different communities supporting each other. So, for example, um, you know, uh, if you look, for example, the Indian community, um, India is a very large country. Uh, but 
you know, we work in, in, in the IT industry, most of us, and, and if you work in IT, uh, you work li likely with a lot of people who have IT background who are from India. And my experience working with, and using this example with Indian people is that, um, number one, um, they're very bright people. Um, and number two, uh, they tend to support their community. If they know somebody else who perhaps, you know, can write in Java or who has .NET experience or who, you know, whatever the case might be, um, in my experience, oftentimes if a position opens up where that skill set is, requir is, is, is required, uh, I'll get resumes from somebody saying, hey, I know somebody. And oftentimes they're promoting their own community. When you go to, um, for example, somebody who owns a restaurant, an Indian restaurant, um, they will say, hey, you know, I have a friend of mine who's got a restaurant, you got to come check it out. They'll promote their friend's restaurant. Um, so even though and they may or may not be getting anything out of that, out of that equation, but there is a sense of unity, uh, I find, within these communities, which allows them to grow and to build. Um, the, I think my experience is the challenge that we have with our community is, you know, um, when they see a service being offered by somebody who is not black, um, they expect to pay whatever it costs to, for that service. When they see somebody else who provides the exact same service with the exact same expertise and, and, and experience, <coughs> it's always, hey, what deal can I get? It's always the hookup. Okay, and so, so that, that's a great point. And again, so we, we need to look at something called the law of duplication, okay? So if your father told you, yo, if you're going to deal with black people, get the black person's discount, BPD. And we all just know it intuitively to go and ask for that discount. You, yeah, go get your bricks, you go get your bricks done at Midas. You, the guy says $59. You know what you say? Did you say $59? Here's my $59. Black mechanic opens a shop. Midas as well. You go in there and say, listen, so what, what can you do for me? Because he doesn't need to feed his kids. Because that's the mentality of the people. But think about this for a second. Think about the one thing that every other group has on the planet every other group on the planet except for us. And this is the master apprentice model. So Star Wars brought it, put it right in front of our face in 1977. Jedi's, Jedi Master, Padawan. Every other group on the planet has the master apprentice model between father and son, mother and daughter. Now you look at us. Fathers may be absent. Mothers may not be in the mental capacity to do that mentorship, other than doing hair and nails and makeup, they're not bringing anything else to the daughters. So we're, we're missing the ingredients to build people who would be in position mentally to support people at that level. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make a, a bold statement here. I'm gonna say that education doesn't matter. It's universal across our race. I know people with a lot of degrees, who would still ask Richard for a discount in his restaurant. Yep. Because that is the, the, the mentality that we have. It's, it's a, I'm going to take you before you take me. So right. if, yes. if you're up which, which goes back to the trust issue. Which goes back to trust. Because I've been told by my mother, my grandmother, my, grand, my great grandmother, not to do business with my own because they're going to try to rip you off. And it's in our subconscious mind. Mm -hmm. So then we bring it out verbally, we manifest it in, into reality, and then Richard's taken aback because he's built his business in our community. Nothing wrong with serving oxtail, mm -hmm. but I have never eaten oxtail at Bistro Nola. I've eaten things I had never eaten anywhere else, but I've never <laughs> eaten oxtail <laughs> at Bistro Nola. You never right? had oxtail? <laughs> Man. Right? Oh, what? But that's it. Uh, so, I have to tell you guys, if, if you think, oh, sorry, Wayne, continue. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead Bennett. No, I didn't want to interrupt you, man. Sorry. No, no. All, all, I'm, all I'm saying is the, the, the mentality has been given to us, especially by those who are raised in the Caribbean and, and the United States and Canada. Mm -hmm. If you yeah. talk to blacks from Africa, you find a different mentality. Well, definitely. And, and if I may be so bold as to say, think about it. If you're talking uh, people from uh, East Indian descent, um, Asian, whether it be Chinese, Taiwanese, or whatever, uh, we're one of the only people who over 400 years have had to face a divide and conquer, I guess, oppressive movement against us. So we don't, our institutions that existed 
um, those same, uh, you know, um, person to person kind of interactions and you listen to your elders and you learn from your dad and you learn from your mom, uh, that's been thrown away. And uh, we've been left to try to like, I guess, you know, fish, uh, you hatch a thousand and each of them are by themselves, you know? So I don't know if you want to go back that far. I mean, 400 years of that has really rendered us um, almost without a base. Listen, you, you, you can't go forward unless you understand where you came from and your points are valid, right? So Larry, Larry works for Lexus. I drive a Lexus, right? So am I going to tell Larry, bring, 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 make brick pads next time you come to the saga? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <To> your friend. <laughs> and and, and I, want, I, want the, I want the employee discount, Larry. You know, the fact that you're carrying another 20 pounds in your bag and paid the $25, <laughs> to check your bag, that's on you. But I need those big pads twenty dollars cheaper, right? Is <laughs> is is a mentality, right? We're so, laughing because it's true. But, oh yeah, exactly. I think there's, there's nothing wrong with us, like this group right here. I say to Wayne, Wayne, hook me up with some internet security. I say to Ben, Ben, uh, what can you do for me in terms of redoing my PC or Stan or Sean or whatever? Yeah. I mean, collectively. It's yeah. when it's when like like it's almost like a cancer with the community that they're, they're entitled to something automatically because of the color. We have the same skin. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's the word right there, entitled. Yep. It's, it's, but you see the thing is guys, I mean we, we have to look at it from, from the point of view of When, when all this stuff is going on, without understanding, as Wayne said, your past, people don't understand where it's coming from. And it's the intent, the need, I should say, that's, that's required right now is for, us to, for people to be getting, and I think it has to start from the kids, is, is, is getting our kids to come out of that mentality because it's just going from generation to generation to generation and it's not stopping, okay? But on the other hand, you have to have... With the, whole dis with, the, with the whole distrust, you have to have people, he said, that when they say they're going to do something and the action, they have to meet. So now you have people who want to go to the black. I'm looking at it from the opposite side. You have people who want to go and, and, and support the black, the black um, businesses, not getting, expecting. So then they would tend to want to back off. And go someplace else with their money. There's a value. So there's two, there's two sides. Yeah, there's two sides there, and I'm looking at it from the opposite side of me mm -hmm. now wanting to go someplace. But like, I mean, as you have that chirping in your head as you're growing up about probably not to support the business, and then I go out there and I go to support. You're not getting the service that you require or want. Right. It just, just reinforces. Okay. Well, I guess it's reinforcing. Is, is that only in restaurants, guys, and grocery stores, or is it no. across the board? No. It's across it's the board. Yeah. It, the, the, the restaurants is the easiest thing to say right now yeah, because no, yeah. I mean look, we've all experienced it and we've seen it numerous times. But I think it's across the board in all in all aspects of business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I personally I've found in my interactions when I you know go into a, a, a black owned business um, that expectation of the level of service. They need to provide to me isn't that important right suddenly somehow to Richard's point because we have the same color skin we have something in common so I don't have to go out of my way to impress you True. Um, and that sends a message to me that sends a message to me number one you're not serious about your business number two because of the way that you know you're treating me as if I was just you know you couldn't kill us whether I was there or not I'm not gonna recommend other people to come to your business and by that by that you know string of events your business begins to suffer because you know our business, good businesses build um, on references. I mean, you can market all you want, you can spend your money on all kinds of advertising, but at the end of the day, the best business that you typically get, and Richard, keep me honest here, is typically referrals. So even if you know, perhaps I like walk in Richard's restaurant, and he says, "Hey, listen, man, you know, um, I know that you're going to bring in a, this party of you know 60 next week, so I'll tell you what, I'll uh, I'll give you a good deal on the steak tonight." Well, there, there's a trade-off because there's something in it for him. If I'm walking in there saying, hey, man, can you do me a solid? I want to get the steak for free. What's in it for him? I mean, how does his business grow if everybody who walks into his restaurant asks him for a deal? He's got bills to pay. He's got staff to pay. You know, how is his business going to grow? And how, I guess the point I'm making here is 
It'll be close. I think there, really two, there are two paradigms in our community. Those who are like, like-minded like us who want to grow our businesses and to network and build that within a community. And then there's the other uh, paradigm, which is just, hey, you know, I'm in it to get what I get, you know, stuff from me. I want to get the latest Jordans. I want to get the baddest car, you know, and screw everybody else. I want my car look nicer than yours. Whenever I open you, you're like, man, your car looks nice. I mean, it's all about this very materialistic, very um, – uh, surface uh, type of mentality that's not very deep and I think that that community isn't receptive to talking about history and and support about they don't care about that kind of stuff you see Sean I want to I don't want to cut you off but I want to say this before I forget it mm-hmm. we're damned if we do and we're damned if we don't mm-hmm. you see right now all of us here in this forum within our community we'd be considered bougie mm-hmm it, we're doing things, we're living life, we're, we're moving forward. Mm-hmm. For people within our community, we're bougie. We, we're on some other level. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, got this, I got this at the beginning of my business. <laughs> you know, they walked in, servers, it's clean. You bougie. I'm bougie. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you know, but I, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Right. And the thing, the thing I had to say was, why would you, I said, if you, do, if you knew me, went to school, I put the time in to get to this point, work my butt off, why would I settle for anything less? I want to be like that French Quebecois chef in the plateau that has a restaurant on par with him. Why would I settle for anything less? Exactly. Exactly. Hey, so, Richard, I have a question for you. Can Shoot. you hear me, Richard? I hear you. Yeah, I was just going to say, so when... Black people, a group of black people come to your restaurant. Does the stress level of you go up? Like no. When they walk in, no, you're okay? It you doesn't change to... because it doesn't change for me because everyone that walks through the door at NOLA is the same. The rules are in place. Mm-hmm. If your attitude is outside of those rules, you'll be dealt with accordingly. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's. Uh, but I want to go back to a point you made just now, Richard, which I think is very important, um, and that is, to some degree or other, I think all of us here can relate to this, um, that it may be the word bougie, it may be something else, but uh, I think this inher- sell out, and it's another one, you know, we have this inherent fear of success, and, or, unless, or at least allowing people to know that we've achieved a certain degree of success, uh, because... We're afraid of um, of what's commonly a shaming tactic. It's a shaming tactic that people typically use when they either uh, typically comes from envy, jealousy. Um, they you know they look at you. If if I was a white guy and I had the same lifestyle, the same uh, accomplishments, they'd say, "Hey, that guy's pretty successful." You know, I'd like to be like him. But when you look too much like them, suddenly they feel as if they're now they feel a sense of inadequacy. And because they feel inadequate now, they got either a shaming tactic of calling you a bougie or calling you a sellout or whatever else because they can't relate to you or they don't feel that they can achieve what you've achieved. And, you know, the way I've looked at it, because I've had to think about this for a long, long time, is I view a sellout as somebody who holds so strongly to a um, expectations that are very low of them. Um, if, if they hold to that, I need to be like, you know, this characteristic, yep. this character on TV. In my, in my view... You're selling out to maintain an image that the media portrays. Um, now, look, if, yeah. if you feel like, you know, perhaps there's something, um, you know, I or any of us can do to, for advice, to mentor, whatever, I'm pretty confident that, you know, if we saw value in that individual and they really meant it, uh, that we'd be more than happy to help them. But if, you know, if your first response is, Psh, whatever, you guys are a bunch of, you're bougie, you know, then I got nothing for you, man, and I don't feel sorry for you either. Well, so check it. Go ahead, go ahead, Go ahead, Ben. Sorry, go, go, what? go, go. Oh, Wayne, Wayne said yeah. t- earlier today we, we had a discussion online and I basically summed it up this way. You know, um, he, he, Wayne sent me a link and the term European blacks was used, which I took offense to, but that's a whole other story. But I ended it by saying my door is always open, but I'm not going to be the one walking anyone up the stairs to my office you got to bring that positive attitude for me to take those steps to help you get into that kitchen or work with that chef. I'm not going to do that groundwork for you. Right. That's right. you got to prove that you want to be here. Right. But, you know, when I see people like that, and this is also getting back to trust, okay? 
not with you. The problem is with them. Because if people were to change their attitude, you know, walking with a smile and suddenly, you know, it becomes a scowl because of what you have accomplished or what you're trying to accomplish, it's absolutely not with you, it's with them. Because people know when they're doing wrong. They know when they're not doing wrong. Not always. Okay? Not always, man. Not always. It's a reaction. They are absolutely aware of where they are in life, okay? But they live trying to deny it. And when it's in their face and they walk in somewhere and and they say, hey, you've got this or you're trying to do this or you're trying to do that, a, a switch goes off in their mind, you know? And they have a decision. There's a decision to make right there. It's either embrace this and maybe th- I, can, I can be in that, go move in that direction and be like that person or ah, the, just, you know, the bougie response. And yeah. this is another thing with the trust. I mean, whenever I go over, let's say, to a client, um, I do house calls, go figure. And I walk into a client uh, of my own ethnic background, you know, um, I'm gauging all their body language, okay? I'm looking at them, how they're looking at me, uh, the distance they're from me, uh, their head motions, even how they blink. Everything just clicks in my mind. How do they view me? And this is a one, this is something we've all talked about trust. We're talking about trust in the black community here, right? From a business perspective. How yeah. about gaining trust? Do you find all of you that you try harder because of your ethnicity to gain trust both inside and outside of your communities? Absolutely. Ooh. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> that never ends, brother. That mm-hmm. never ends. <laughs> well, that never ends. I, Listen, I, I've been I've been doing this for for close to 20 years and I've got to work twice as hard as the next so-called chef to get to get to get to where I got to get to it's just the way it is only to only only twice things are better in Montreal than I thought <laughs> I got it, I got it. <laughs> It's the West Island, not Montreal. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> listen, listen. What you're saying, everybody's saying the same thing. Think about this. The United States is based on the ideology of capitalism. Capitalism is about the pursuit of profit. Okay? Of individual wealth. That's capitalism. I go out, I start my company, I provide goods and services. You give me money, I make profit. I try to make as much profit as I possibly can and increase shareholder value. That's the goal of the corporation. There's no other goal for corporations. Profit, increase shareholder value. Stanley, you agree? Very much so. Yeah. Okay, so when you look at communities, the Jewish community, the Chinese community, the Italian community, the Greek community, the Persian community, the Punjabi community, the Hindu community, what do they all have in common? They are about collectivism, not individualism. And collectivism means we succeed. We're going to create a tide that's going to raise all our ships. Everybody's going to break off some. That's right. We've adopted what our slave masters have told us, which is capitalism is about the individual. So I, Michael Jordan, am going to make a billion dollars for myself and I'm going to sell shoes to you and you're going to give me the profit and I'm going to go buy the Charlotte Hornets for me. Okay. I Tiger Woods are going to sell you a game because you're going to watch me on the cable you paid for and you're going to celebrate me because I kind of look like you. And then I'm going to put a TW on my hat. You're going to go out and buy it on sale at golf town and I'm going to make big money for me and do little or nothing for the people who look like me, who supported me. Huh. What's the, so Tiger Woods, Michael Jordan, I mean, Magic Johnson said, oh, I see what you guys are doing, but I'm going to do it differently. I'm going to be collectivist. I'm going to create, I'm going to franchise Fat Burger and Starbucks and, and the Magic Johnson theaters. I'm going to take all these things and put them in a community. And then I'm going to sell them all and buy 10% of the Dodgers for me. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in individualism, it, it is bizarre. Remember Superman and Bizarro? Bizarro was all that was wrong with Superman, but just as strong. 
The bizarre role <laughs> in the black community is, is individualism. Mm -hmm. Well, here's the and, thing. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Wayne. And, the, and we're, we're copying, we're duplicating our slave owners in his land without understanding what individualism is doing to us in the diaspora. That's with why, rules, by the way. I, excuse me? With his rules, by with the way. With his rules. With his rules. Okay, uh, if I can make an observation on that. So when you look at the uh, the model, the, the Michael Jordan model, where he has his shoes made in China for 10 cents and sells them for $200 uh, to kids who can't afford it, I mean, he's not forcing them to spend their money, but, you know, I get it. Um, but, you know, if you're thinking about trying to get from where you are today, financially speaking, to where you want to get to financially speaking, if your goal is to get someplace where you've got seven or eight digits in your in your bank account, you can either go the way of, of collectivism, which has an altruistic component to it, so, you know, um, uh, you know the tide raises, raises all boats, or, uh, but in that scenario, there has to be some degree of trust in your the community that you're working with that they actually will support your business and not drain your and drain the swamp um the other approach that the michael jordan's and the tiger woods uh camp uh, pursue is it doesn't require trust from anybody right so i mean look there's i think there's pros and cons in both scenarios uh you know collectivism didn't build the iphone uh, collectivism didn't build google uh, collectivism didn't build, um, you know, uh, um, the Tesla. Um, so great inventions come from perhaps individuals, but to your point, if your objective is to not just, you know, in, to increase your own personal wealth, but to raise all, the, have the tide raise all boats, uh, I'm, I'm, all I'm basically saying is that there's two alternatives that you can go with. One requires uh, a certain degree of trust, and one doesn't require any trust at all. Well, I'm, not so, I'm, not so, I'm not a socialist, eh? I'm not a socialist. <laughs> I'm not a Are socialist. You sure, Fidel? <laughs> you, you all right? No, but I got, I got, what, I got what, a great example for you guys. Go ahead. Okay, I'm in Texas right now. And part of the fear with respect to Mexicans, okay, okay if you're down here, it's different one than what the media is portraying, okay? This is how they work. You go to a new area, a nice subdivision, they have uh, either uh, a full family, extended family, or they have two or three families purchase a home, okay? Live in the home for a number of years. They don't, many of them do not have the highest paying jobs, but as a collective, they're making yes. a lot of money. They're they hard sell off too. the house. Yeah, very hard we, working, by the we way. Worked yeah. free. Sell, we worked for free yeah. for 400 years. We're hard working. <laughs> we worked for free for 100 years. Obviously, well, apparently I worked for peas and rice. So anyway. <laughs> 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 so they buy the house a few years later when it's time to renew the mortgage they buy another house within 15 years they own three or four houses i live in what i'm where i'm staying right now is an area called pearland texas which is just outside houston city limits and it's working class a lot of people work at the medical center a lot of professionals out here it medical doctors you name it and there's an increasing number of Latinos because that's how they move, right? And eventually they gain a lot of financial power that way. A good friend of mine in Montreal purchased a condo, two floor, top floor condo, penthouse, on sources with a few other friends and his girlfriend at the time. And the idea is they got it as a bank repo for something like $50,000 under municipal evaluation. They said, we're gonna build this up, build this up, five six years down the road we'll sell we'll split the profits we can each buy our own properties or we'll buy another property did you know that after two years two of the partners said they didn't want to pay anymore they just dropped out and my friend and his now wife had to end up buying the place and living in it i mean wow. can we not just see more than two years down the road this no. is a problem that's that's so it's that kind of goes here, back um here, i'm sorry go ahead here the latin community East Indian community, the Asian community, they have it, they have it down to a science. This is how they grow. Yes. Now they own big swaths of developments. Right. And they I mean, came from nothing. And to put to, to further emphasize your point, Bennett, you know, um, their window of um, uh, the depth of their perception or their, their, their window of time in terms of what they're trying to accomplish is a longer term solution. I think some of the challenges that uh, we experience within our own community is that 
Um, we're very short-sighted. We're thinking about, you know, I want to get new rims for the car. Uh, I want to get the latest pair of sneakers. I want to get the latest outfit. Our, our, our vision of time is the next paycheck. You know, it's next time, man. the next time, an instant gratification. I want to look like I'm balling when ne the next time you see me, see so how this perception I'm something I'm not. And when you're when you're sort of when you're surrounded by that mentality, and I know we grew, we all grew up in Montreal, and, you know, um, in different neighborhoods. Where I, I grew up in a very rough neighborhood. If you guys know Cote d'Azur and North Mount, you know, it was a rough neighborhood. So I think a lot of people had the perspective of even just their their um, the span of life for them wasn't going to be very long. We're not going to live to be 80 or 70 or 80 or 90. You know, we're all going to die pretty soon, so I'm going to get what I can get before I'm gone. And if I can get more than you got, whoever has more toys when they die wins, right? And it's that, it's that sense of desperation and the need to accomplish something in a very short span of time, I think that creates that, 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 uh, that lack of, uh, of vision uh, that, you know, for example, the Mexican community, uh, those folks you're talking about has. Um, I, for example, when I lived in Mississauga, right across the street from where I lived, um, there was a Filipino family. And it was a house about the same size as mine, about 2,500 square feet, uh, fully detached, uh, one garage. Um, but they had five cars in the, in the driveway. Um, they all lived as a huge family lived there, and they all, you know, they all worked in probably some, you know, average jobs. But when they combined their their incomes and their wealth, they were able to pay off the house. They were able to buy all these cars. You know, they saw the value of working together, and they had a, an inherent trust. That's um, collectivism. They, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I hear what you saying. You're you're not wrong about that. Right. I think the absence uh, the absence of that option for us leaves us with individualism. Okay. Everybody's a pioneer. Uh, you're, you're a pioneer in the okay. right. so, so I ask you guys this then. How does it change? Yes. That, yes. I was going to segue right into that home. right now. Everything starts from the home. Yes. Uh, and if the home, if the home doesn't know what they're talking about, what are your, what are your other options? Yes. yes. Yeah. Well, this is I how I, this, go ahead. This, this is how I see it. And you guys can say if I'm right or if I'm wrong. I just think Moving forward, you will see villages within the community start to happen. Example, I deal with men on a professional level because we're on that same page. I will refer because people to Ben. we trust each other. We trust each other. I will refer people to Ben because I know that Ben's going to handle his business. Ben will send groups to me because he knows I'm going to handle my business. Someone looking for internet security in Ontario, Wayne's name's going to come up because I know Wayne's going to handle his business. Right. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And you're going to have to leave some people behind that unfortunately don't want to handle their business. Right. And so what makes people part of this group, this collective group, is not what we look like or where we're from, it's, but, it's, but it's how we think. And at the end of the day, you have to find some degree of pride in that. If I say, you know what, I know this guy who is um, – who's a sharp IT guy, he'll take care of your needs. His name is Bennett Kelly. I take pride in knowing, number one, that I've referred people to somebody who I know is going to do a great job and make me look good in, in terms of, you know, I've referred to the right guy. And I'll take pride in the fact that when his business grows, I can say, you know what, um, I knew the guy when he was a shop of one and now he's a shop of ten. Um, and, you know, I can, I can brag about his business. I mean, if we can't take pride in each other's work, we can't help each other out. Mm -hmm. Very you know, listen, you need to be able you need to be able to vouch for somebody. Vouching means you take your reputation and yep. you wrap it around that person. So back in the day, hey, if you had melanin, I vouch for you. Right? You're black, I'm down. And I would get burned time after time after time until I figured out about value systems. Mm -hmm. And Richard and I have known each other since the first day of kindergarten in nineteen seventy two. And mm -hmm. We weren't always on the same page, but we were most often on the same page because our heritage was very close. Sean, I met you in high school and at Dawson. Larry, I met you around the way down by Benny Farm. Ben and I went to Dawson yeah. to La Fontaine together. Stanley and I went to Dawson Selby together and high school. So we have all these connections. What I'm saying is, even though our vices are not identical, there's critical mass in the right direction where we have respect for the value of people's knowledge and it should be compensated fairly for it. That we all agree on. Yeah. Yes. yes. Two, speaking the King's English or the Queen's English or whatever you want to call it is not being white. 
is being professional. That's We're right. We're not here talking about yeah, being woke exactly. and scurred and us scurred and all that crazy stuff I hear. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, you know, God bless you if you can speak like that, but that's not who I ever was. And right. I'm not posing with my English. This is actually who I was. When I met Bennett at, at La Fontaine in 1983, he sounded then like he sounds now. He looked different. He looked more like Prince. I won't, I won't lie. <laughs> 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 oh, I, I, I got pictures. I got pictures. But from, yeah, back yeah. The, from back in the day to today, uh, you know, we're reconnecting 30 years later. I'm, I'm ecstatic to know that somebody that I met in 1983, 84, 32 years later, we're here on this on this connection, and their value systems are in alignment. And we did that in our own individual bubbles: L.A., Atlanta, all. Ottawa, Montreal, Toronto, Houston, Texas, slash Pierrefonds when he gets back. But we're doing that in our own individual <laughs> bubbles. But we're on the same page. So yes. what I'm asking everyone here is, we have five, six people on the line today. Five, six yeah. people could become 50 people if they, if I'm not saying to prove anything to us, if they like what they hear from the, from the, from the YouTube, and if they believe that elevation is the answer for the race. And it's not each one be a pioneer and do only for yourself, but each one show one, each one teach one, pro kids, 81, mm -hmm. each one teach one and bring some young buck onto this call. And I say male for now, female down the road. I'm not saying it's, it's a gender thing, but I think if there's a 30 year old that we can save some time by having them on this call, by them listening to what is happened before them, we're all professionals yes. in our own way, doing our own thing. Right. But we can, if we yeah. get a 25 year old who can, who had the capacity to pick up what we were dropping, now we can save that brother time, money, energy, and heartbreak yes. by him being on this call. And yep. and and that's yes. how I would like to pay it forward. So mm -hmm. we're gonna. I think part of it other. too. Too. I wait. I I completely totally agree with that. With with what you just said. Um. And I think part of it is not just the young bucks, the each one teach one, because that's important. But um, I think there are, I, I will hazard a guess to say that there are other professionals like us out there who are, uh, who are out there on their own, the cold, just trying to make, to make it work and would like to um, um, some uh, peers to talk to, to bounce ideas off of. Um, to just get advice from, to refer business to, and to get business referred to them. And concept of it's a two-way street. Uh, inf you know, information in business doesn't just go one direction. It goes in both directions. That's how the tide lifts all boats. Right. So I agree with that. To your point, networking to a lot of people is, can you hook me up now that I'm hooked up later for you until I need the next hookup? Have you had that happen to you? So value needs to flow both ways. The law of reciprocity, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Mm -hmm. So I go to Bistro Nola. I have eaten at, I have not eaten at a tablecloth restaurant in Montreal other than Bistro Nola since no, today in my life? No. Nope. Since, since he opened that restaurant, if I'm in Montreal, I don't care where I am, Montreal's small compared to this place I'm living here. And I get myself up there, I bring people with me, Nola virgins with me come they sit down to eat and have a great experience they'll take it from there <laughs> right yep. right right Bennett I'll learn what you do right. I know people in Montreal there's things you can do for some of my clients in Montreal contract capacity Larry LA I'm gonna hook you up with with um with Ronald and Phil's if you don't have that connection and there's a couple other people down there you need you need to connect with from LA that I've got down there we'll get that going and Sean, the same thing in Atlanta. Yep. This is, this, and and this in the back doing. of all of our minds, we got to think about, okay, what can we do now for Wayne? What business can we send Wayne's way? Because it's got to go both ways. I just want to write some peas, honestly. That's all. <laughs> yeah. You can have it, man. Or an oxtail. In the end, I want an oxtail and the rice and peas. And Wayne, remember the pigtail, huh? Exactly. The pigtail and the piece of salt meat in, in the rice. But <laughs> it, it, in the end, what we're doing here is letting each other know oh, we're not alone. Stanley was in Ottawa for a long time. He'd always say to me, man, I wish you were in Ottawa. Well, now I'm 
I'm in Ottawa. I'm on this Google thing, and now I'm in Ottawa. And and Larry, you're in LA, and they all. I would love to live out there, but now I'm in LA, right? <laughs> True. We, we the power of the internet is giving us the ability to create the community in the village that we yes. we we had back in the day. And right. when we moved away from Montreal, those right. of us who did, we lost it. And maybe we yes. still maybe we should have lost it because a lot of people that we had around us were always elevated. Some of them were haters. Yeah. And we had to disconnect from those guys and, and reconnect. You, you notice for those of us who are outside of Montreal, when you drive by to Montreal and you get to to the old streets that you grew up on, they seem smaller. And when yes, you meet the people is. that you used to hang with at a bar or at a, you know, whatever, you talk to them. The conversation goes back to who you were the last time they saw you, not who you are. No one asked me who, who I am. Yeah. They remind right. me of the, of the dunk I missed in 1984. Or someone dunking on me back in 83. I'm it was like, classic. It was, yeah. And, I, and you know what I do? I go, well, remind me again. Tell me again. Tell me again. And they tell me. And I say, okay, cool. And I, and I, and I just, 1987, stay right there in that room. Because I know when I leave that bar and I leave them, I'll be back in. 2016, but they don't need yeah, to come there with. Really. They don't need to come there with me. <laughs> right. <laughs> that, that's very well said and very well because I, I've experienced the exact same. We've talked about it numerous times. Uh -huh. it's, it's it's just nature. It's just nature of how things progress and how 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 things just stay the same in certain places. So yes, yes. You know, if if, if, if nobody true. can relate to who you are now, they'll always want to relate to the the least common denominator of who you were. Right. Oh, they and, and they want to relate to me in, in a position of superiority. They need to bring me down and exactly. elevate themselves because maybe back in, in 80, 85, they were the man at whatever was going on in 85. Right. Yeah. And they, wanted, they, want, they want to serve notice to me that as whoever you are today doesn't matter because back in yeah. 32 years ago, I or some man who got a better of you and I want to remind you of that. And I'm like, that is fantastic. Hey, you know what? Why don't we just go over to Perez and get some sip sacks? Just do some lemonade in the box. Hey, I wonder if I still have sip sacks. Use flash when Perez's gone, man. I, yeah, Perez is out. Exactly, exactly. And, and maybe in that moment they'll get the message. Right, right. But I'm not I'm going back there. But to your, point, to your point, Wayne, they're declaring the individual or the value system that they have in that moment. So you know right away. All right, you know. We can be friends, we can have this beer, but you know, when it comes to this conversation that we're having here uh, with each other, that's somebody who just doesn't qualify. And it doesn't matter whether they're black, white, Chinese, or whatever the case might be. Um, it, it, a lot of it really has to do with the value system. It has to do with um, your uh, personal desire to pursue uh, excellence in whatever field that you happen to be in, and you happen to be black, right? Um, and that's the kind of way, the way that I view it. I mean, when I look, for example, at um, we need to wrap up pretty soon, but I just talk about, for example, when I hire, because I'm a hiring manager, and um, <clears throat> I've had to hire a number of people uh, since I've been here in the U.S. Uh, one thing I make a point of is when I do hire somebody, I try to hire an American citizen, simply because I'm in their country, and um, they deserve to have, I think, first pass or first rights, uh, first access to a job if they have the proper qualifications. Um, I also am aware that in many instances, although nobody will say it out loud, um, in some cases, people will over, will look over a resume from somebody who is black. And in my experience, particularly if you're black and you're male, um, if you're black and you're female, you generally have more options or, or more opportunities. Um, but I will look at that. I'll look at that resume and I'll give that resume the same degree of of um, of, uh, of um, recognition. Uh, I will interview them oftentimes to see, okay, you know, what's the person like? You know, is there an opportunity for me to give somebody an to, to give them an, a, a job that, number one, they're going to make me look good. Uh, they're go-getters. And guess what? They happen to be a, a, a young black man or a young black woman who, you know, may not have had that opportunity elsewhere. So uh, just because they're black doesn't mean they're getting the job because I got burnt by that once before too. Um, but, you know, um, oftentimes you have people, for example, like Richard, you know, you, you work twice as hard to get the same job done that, that, that someone else is, is getting recognition for with half the effort. You know, um, I want people who work their hard. If you're going to work their hard for me, you can make me look good. Come on board and let's get this job done. But I'm looking for that person to perform. All right. So listen, all that's fantastic. I agree. We need a call to action. The call to action is this. If you have 
clothes to you. See if you can find somebody who looks like you to buy those clothes from. If you have a dentist, you have an eye doctor, you have a general practitioner, you have someone who's a mechanic, someone who's selling you cars. See if you can give the option to someone who looks like you and see if they deserve the option. If they do, continue doing so. I have, you know, my accountant now looks like me. My dentist looks like me. My doctor does not. My, um, my mechanic does not look like me, but I'm, I'm looking to find opportunity to money back into the community from people who are trying to get to the next level. Yeah. And that's, right. that's, that's all we can do here on, on, on this call. And to your point, we've got to vet them carefully uh, before we do that. So you want to make sure you vet them so that when you recommend people uh, to go to them, that they make you look good, that the recommendation looks good. Yeah, that's very it. important, Sean. Very important. Yeah. If I'm, if I'm vouching for you, I know you. If I don't know you, I can't vouch for you. So when exactly. you say, can you hook me up? I go send me your resume, and then I sit down and I have a little screening conversation to your point, Sean, and if the person shows me that their value systems are in alignment with moving forward and moving up and they're professional, you say please, you say thank you, and you show up on time, you do what you said you're going to do. welcome aboard. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I don't have time. And, 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 to, and to wrap that up is, <clears throat> and the next step, in my opinion, is, all right, uh, you've passed my criteria. Um, I, I, you know, I think that you are not, that you're progressive, you've got the, the, the capabilities, and by the way, remember, you got to pay this back. That's how, the, that's how the community rises. I can't keep giving to you if you don't find a way to give back. It may be just your time, it may be hiring my son who might need a job in a couple of years, and he may come your way, but it's got to be some, to your point, Wayne, the whiff of what's in it for me. It's got to be reciprocal. You can't be a person that after you leave, there, they say they'll never hire a black person again. And we know there's people like that out there. Mm -hmm. You're the last black mm -hmm. person they're going to hire because you have now become the standard or high for whatever blackness means. Each one of us represents that black person to, to people that we interface with and they're looking at us and saying I'm more like you then I'll do business with you. But, if there's, it, but there's always that dummy who's going <laughs> to Go out there and just blow up the village, right? And and make it tougher for us. You can always tell when someone meets you for the first time, and they're not coming at you with an open, to you with the last mindset of the person who did them dirty the last time who looked like you. And you got <laughs> and you got to detox them from that before you can move forward. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, I'm going to start wrapping it up here, but before we go, uh, let me just go around the table really quickly. If there's any last thoughts or if you want to, uh, to plug something, I'll start betting with yourself. I uh, just want to say that um, um, I'm really inspired by what we're doing here, and I think uh, I have to agree wholeheartedly. I've been thinking about it since he said it with Stanley's, and it all starts with education. We're the schools of education, so get things started. Uh, otherwise, I just want to say good night to everybody and um, keep cool. Good night. Good night. Enjoy. Houston. Cool. Good night, Larry. I, w I would just like to say thank you for letting me join this group. Why didn't you ask me earlier? <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, I, I want to do this. I want to keep doing this every week or every two weeks or whenever you guys want to do it. And hopefully, I put more input to the conversation next time. That's great. Stay, I want to say good night to you. <laughs> glad to have you here, Larry. We're glad to have you, you here. Thank you so Richard's much. Joining us. I appreciate it. Richard. Good, another good conversation. I missed the first two. Uh, just got to keep moving forward. And uh, rice and peas are here, boys. <laughs> yes, man. <laughs> I'm coming to you. I want the honor to rice and peas. Now, wait. Is it rice and peas or peas and rice? Quick. Doesn't matter. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Richard. Uh, Stanley? Well, guys, once again, I want to say this has been, it's always a pleasure. And this, for me, is becoming something I'm looking forward to. Um, I, love, I like the discussion, the way how it's going. Uh, I, I feel that we have, as how we ended off here, is a real good launching point for, for further um, initiatives in sense of what do we do to go forward? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we're, we're, we're touching and we can just drop down into so many different rabbit holes 
within all these discussions that we have. And I mean, I, I think we're going to get we're going to get into a nice flow of of basically stating out what what we see from each of our own perspective, the issues are, and then being able to put on the table, hey, okay, as Wayne said, call to action of yeah, we can do this, we can do this, we can do this, and how can we go forward and get it done to bring more people in, to get more people involved, and to be able to impart a lot of knowledge that we have on this forum here. Yes, and to your point, Stanley, I think the um, the fact that this is a recorded session, it's live now, but it's recorded. Uh, if you know people who you think um, would benefit from this, people who you think are potential um, uh, you know, professionals we can talk to, send them a copy of this link, have them forward their comments, and you know we've we've laid it all out here for them. Um, and, uh, you know, I think this is, we, we can use what we've built here already uh, to start things rolling in that direction. Uh, anything that you want to, plan, uh, to um, plug, Stanley? No, I don't have anything to plug at this present point in time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Wayne. Yeah, listen, uh, apologies for um, dominating the mic <laughs> tonight. No, no, no. It, it, it's one of those things where I want to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of where we're starting from and what the real issues are and where we want to go. So we kind of got that off the table today. I don't think we have to delve back into the history as much and tomorrow. But the bottom line is there are books, there are videos, there are, are resources, and you guys who live in the States have access to a bunch of good stuff to, to educate yourselves and that you can let us know about. So, Thrilled to be a part of it. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Enjoyed the show? Like, share, and subscribe. And thanks for joining us in The Man Cave.